very warm welcome to the interview on France 24. I'm Sanam Chantier. Joining us from Washington, D.C. is Trita Parsi, a Middle East foreign policy expert and the founder and president of the National Iranian American Council, an organization that advised the Obama administration throughout nuclear negotiations between Tehran and the world powers. Now, earlier in 2017, Trita published a book on that very historic accord, Losing an Enemy, Obama, Iran, and the Triumph of Diplomacy. Trita Parsi, thank you very much for speaking to us. Thank you so much for having me. Now, Trita, we're having this conversation at a pivotal moment. We're only possibly days away from a deadline for Donald Trump to announce whether or not he certifies that Iran is uh, complying with this 2015 nuclear pact, also known as the JCPOA. Now, you've talked about the very dangerous ramifications if Washington turns its back on that deal, including the possibility of war? Certainly. Remember that in 2012, 2013, the United States and Iran were actually very close to a military confrontation. Part of the reason why secret negotiations were begun in uh, Oman and part of the reason why the Obama administration became so committed towards finding a diplomatic solution was precisely because of the realization that if it wasn't a diplomatic solution, it would lead to war. So this nuclear deal eliminated two very bad scenarios. It eliminated the scenario of the Iranians having access to a path to a nuclear bomb and eliminated the risk of war between the United States and Iran. Well, if you undo the deal, then you're putting those two back bad, you're putting back those two very bad scenarios onto the table. And what about the argument that we're hearing that conflict is far-fetched? Is it not possible that decertifying the accord is uh, merely a symbolic gesture for Trump to save face, having called this the worst deal ever negotiated? Because, frankly, punitive measures may not even be imposed on Iran by Congress. And even if they are, it is possible that the other members of the P5 plus one group that sat around that negotiation table with Iran will stick to their end of the bargain. There are quite a few ifs there, right? Uh, on the first uh, one, you know, Trump would need to decertify but not call for new sanctions. Congress would then have to uh, truly be wise and adults in the room and not impose sanctions on the Iranians. And then on be beyond that, the European companies would have to feel enough uh, comfort and, and safety to be able to risk going into the Iranian market, knowing quite well that uh, Congress at any moment would be able to actually go back and impose sanctions. So quite a few ifs there. But there's another aspect of this that is also important. This is not just about decertification. It's also about the fact that he's going to be announcing a new, as they call it, a comprehensive Iran policy that, based on what uh, has been leaked thus far, would contain significant escalation in the region against Iran. Now, here's the deal. If you have escalation against Iran while you at the same time do not have a channel of communication with Iranians because the Trump administration has not bothered to engage in any dialogue with Iran, then you are putting the United States itself at risk because you are not going to easily be able to control the escalation. And without a dialogue, you don't have the escalatory options. And that can very well lead to a scenario in which the situation gets out of control and suddenly the two sides find themselves in a conflict that neither of them may have actually intended for. This yeah. has happened numerous times in history, and there's no reason why it wouldn't happen under Donald Trump as president. But if we look beyond the Tehran-Washington relations, could the unraveling of the deal impact America's own relationship with its European allies, considering, of course, they were part of the pact. Absolutely. I mean, that's actually one of the main things over here, which is that this is not Trump picking a fight with Iran. This is Trump picking a fight with France, with Britain, with Germany, with the Chinese and the Russians and everyone else. I mean, remember, this deal was embodied in a UN Security Council resolution that the United States itself voted in favor of. This is the Trump administration essentially picking a fight with the entire international community, with the exception of Saudi Arabia and Israel. Now, Trita, I think it's really impossible to escape the very loud echoes of criticism from Washington that we're hearing regarding Iran's regional behavior, and you just mentioned Saudi Arabia and Israel, which we know actually is not part of that nuclear deal, though I think we all remember being in Vienna back in 2015 and hearing a message from Iran's foreign minister, Mohammad Javad Zarif, saying, if the JCPOA, if that nuclear deal is clinched, there could be collaboration between Iran and the U.S. in the fight against the Islamic State group. But was that, as some have been calling it in D.C., just a sales pitch? 
No, because at the end of the day, there actually was collaboration between the United States and Iran against ISIS. It was coordinated through the Iraqi government. Uh, and that did take place. However, the main failure here is that... So that's been denied by both sides, that there was no direct collaboration at any point? Of course. They would deny it because, you know, there are sensitivities on both sides. But they don't deny that they did coordinate it via the Iraqi government that essentially was in the middle between the two of them. Iraqi, Iranian and American uh, fighter jets were flying in the same theater. Um, you don't usually do that unless you have some means of communication, direct or indirect. Um, but beyond that, there was actually a failure here because there was a promise. There was a promise in order to be able to expand on this diplomacy and then use that diplomacy to address the concerns that exist on the Western side about Iranian policies in the region and vice versa. But that can only happen as a result of further negotiations that would build upon the nuclear deal, not reopen the nuclear deal. And I think that opportunity may still be able to be resurrected, but only after the United States first fully commits itself to the nuclear deal. The U.S. is in no position to request additional negotiations if it cannot even respect and live up to the existing deal that it has negotiated. I think we have to stick to the region and address what's going on in Yemen, that ongoing conflict with, of course, the Saudi-led coalition supporting one side and Iran backing, uh, reportedly, the Houthi rebels. What have you heard from Iranian officials, if anything? Is there any solution in sight? There certainly is a solution. This is not an intractable conflict that cannot be resolved, but it requires that the Iranians and the Saudis really get to the negotiating table uh, and start talking to each other and, and stop fueling the conflicts that exist in the region. Right now, any conflict in the region runs the risk of being hijacked by the Saudi-Iranian rivalry. The Iranians have made numerous overtures to the Saudis for diplomacy. Those have been rejected. The Crown Prince went on an interview and said that there's no reason to talk to the Iranians because nothing can come out of that. The problem, I think, on the Saudi side is that, from their perspective, there is no reason to go to the negotiating table with the Iranians at a moment when the Saudis feel pretty weak and they believe the Iranians feel pretty strong, unless they first exhaust whatever it is that Trump may or may not agree to do on Iran. If Trump is willing to take on a very, very harsh position on Iran, step back into the region and help balance the Iranians, well, from the Saudi perspective, it's better to open up negotiations, if at all, once that has happened, rather than before fully knowing how far is the Americans willing to go to fight the Iranians on behalf of the Saudis. And with that, it seems to add even more fuel to this already existing fire. The U.S. will, in the coming days, designate Iran's Revolutionary Guards Corps as a terrorist organization. What response can we expect to hear from Tehran? Well, we've seen that uh, the IRGC has suggested that uh, they will then do the same, which means that they would consider the United States military in the region in the same category as ISIS. I mean, these are, frankly, there's nothing good that will come out of this. There's one thing to be able to say that there's significant problems with the IRGC. There's a very different re thing to be able to go all the way and put them on a list that will, frankly, only have a symbolic meaning until the Iranians respond and then suddenly things can get out of control. Remember, the Bush administration was proposed this. They rejected it. The Pentagon rejected it. The Obama administration was suggested this as well. They rejected it because at the end of the day, the balance of equities simply was and such that such a move would advance U.S. interests or would help stabilize the Middle East. All it will do is that it will deepen the U.S.-Iran tensions and increase the risk of a larger confrontation. Now, moving on from that, Trita, how would you say that pro-so-called diplomacy, pro-JCPOA organizations like yours, NIAC, can continue to be influential when we are clearly seeing that the likes of FDD, Foundation for Defensive, Defense of Democracies, are now very much at the helm of uh, Trump's Iran policy and sanctions policy, of course. Well, um, any organization that works on any type of issue knows that there are moments in which you will have a listening ear in the White House, and that will make it much easier for you to be able to move forward with your agenda. And there's moments in which you don't have a listening ear. And then you have a different strategy of trying to prevent the worst from happening and prevent some of the policies that you believe would lead to a very negative scenario. Right now, for instance, 
the groups that are very much opposed to this are very active on Capitol Hill. And if this goes to a vote in Congress, there is a decent chance that Congress actually would not be able to pass new sanctions on Iran because most Democrats recognize the dangers of doing this. And the Trump administration or President Trump himself has created so much discord within the Republican caucus. So there's reasons to believe that several Republicans may also decide not to vote in favor of sanctions. And that would be a perfect example of how even outside of a, a listening ear in the White House, these organizations can still have a decisive impact on the outcome. Lastly, Trifta, and very briefly, the argument that we keep hearing is that a move on Iran, especially at a time when it's clearly, and this is according to international bodies, it's sticking to its commitments within the framework of the deal, could hurt chances of diplomacy with North Korea. It could hurt chances with diplomacy with anyone, not just North Korea. At the end of the day, in order to be able to have effective diplomacy, those countries involved have to have credibility uh, and be able to convey that credibility so the other side finds value in striking a deal with you. If Trump kills this deal, despite the fact that the Iranians are living up to the agreement, despite the fact that his secretary of defense doesn't want him to decertify, despite the fact that his secretary of state doesn't want him to decertify, why would any other country ever really engage in any security negotiations with the United States? On that note, Trita Parsi, the president of NIAC and the author of Losing an Enemy, Obama, Iran, and the Triumph of Diplomacy. Thank you so much for speaking to us. And thank you for watching the interview on France 24 with me, Sanam Chantier. Do stay tuned.